All right, well, how about we just get started? Uh, hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be uh, moderating this discussion today. Uh, I apologize for no video. This is last minute, and I uh, was not ready for that. All right, so today we have Reed Rubenstein joining us to discuss foreign influence on campus. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein is a senior counselor at the America First Legal Foundation. Mr. Rubenstein will be speaking for about 15 minutes, then we will open it up for audience questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Reed Rubenstein. Thank you very, very much. It is a pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, the Middle East Forum, I want to start by saying this, the Middle East Forum does tremendous work. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of being part of some of your efforts going back to the, I want to say the early mid-aughts. Um, God bless you for everything that you do. My name is Reed Rubenstein. Uh, as you heard, I am a senior counselor. I'm at the uh, America First Legal Foundation. Um, by way of background, I was uh, an attorney in private practice for most of my career. I uh, was an early adapter of, of the last president and uh, worked during the campaign and uh, both the primary and the general, uh, was on the transition, went to the Department of Treasury, among other things, to try and figure out where all that money Barack Obama gave to uh, the Iranians went to. Uh, was at the Department of Justice for about 18, 19 months, and then at the last 18 months of the administration, I was the general counsel of the Department of Education. And it was in that role that, that I had occasion to uh, work on issues related to foreign investment in U.S. institutions of higher education. In the materials that were sent to me, I was asked to address um, the following questions. First, uh, universities have mostly ignored the law as regulators. Uh, why? Why did they refuse to enforce the law? Where is the money coming from? How deep is foreign influence on U.S. college campuses? And what is the role of Middle Eastern actors in this? So let's take those each in order. Why did the federal government refuse to enforce a law which has been on the books since approximately 1985, 1986? Um, all those years, it wasn't until uh, Betsy DeVos and, and the Trump administration took control of the Department of Education that really anybody paid much attention to uh, foreign influence on U.S. campuses, at least at the Department of Education level. For a number of years, Going back to uh, the early part of the Obama administration, the FBI had been warning uh, college presidents and, and chancellors about the risk posed by uh, foreign actors, uh, yet nothing was done. And, and, and this is, by the way, a bipartisan problem. Um, the, uh, during the Bush administration, the the folks then running the Department of Education allowed universities to anonymize the identity of foreign donors, uh, which coincided with a massive increase of money, primarily from People's Republic of China. Uh, but there really was never much appetite to take on the higher education lobby or the higher education industry until we arrived. Where is the money coming from? Well. The money is coming in torrents. It is really hard to overstate how substantial uh, the amount of cash flowing from overseas into U.S. universities is. And it's not just into universities. Um, it is important, I think, for folks to begin to conceptualize the problem, or I should say in order to, for folks to conceptualize the problem accurately, uh, there are two things you have to really fully understand and assimilate. Number one, um, universities, the, the ones that get the vast majority of the foreign funding, 
most of them are ones you've heard of. Um, they're not really schools. Many of them are sort of better conceived of as hedge funds with an educational, small educational operation attached. Um, many of these organizations operate effectively as multinational corporations. My background, again, was doing commercial law and investigations and, and, and other things. And so I brought kind of a different conception to it. What you have with these institutions, again, the big ones for the most part, are, are just large businesses and they have foreign operating units uh, and they view themselves as having foreign markets. They, your average university, whether it's Harvard or Yale in the Ivy League or uh, University of Texas or University of Michigan, uh, they don't really conceptualize themselves as American institutions in any meaningful sense of the word. Uh, so they're gonna go where the money is and there's a lot of money overseas and that's where they go. Um, we don't have, I don't have now, since I've been out of the government for over two years, I don't have the latest figures, um, to share with you. Uh, but the numbers, of, of are very substantial. We estimate that the work that we did uncovered somewhere north of 15 to $17 billion, billion with a B dollars that previously had not been disclosed to the federal government. And so uh, you can only imagine on a, on a national scale um, how significant foreign money is to the folks who run uh, higher education in the United States. The money is coming from basically three, uh, three sources. Number one is China and instrumentalities of the Chinese Communist Party. Number two, it comes from what I'll call more traditional Middle Eastern actors, Saudi Arabia primarily, but others, the Emiratis and, and so forth. And number three is Qatar. Uh, between those, those three uh, sources, you probably pick up well over 60% of the foreign money flowing into US universities today. There are other sources which are you know, less troublesome. Uh, England, for example, uh, a lot of English companies do business with American universities, um, French, Canadian, Australian, uh, but, but the, the weight of the, of the money and certainly the source of the concern and the problem um, are the three sources that I identify. How deep is the influence? Well, it's pretty deep, um, particularly with respect to the CCP, it's very deep. Um, and you can see this, uh, a, good, a good test or a good example, I should say, a good paradigm is the Penn Biden Center. Uh, you may have been reading about Joe Biden and his son and so forth. Well, there were emails on that infamous laptop. Um, between Hunter Biden and, and his agent. He had, he had an agent, a Hollywood agent. And in these emails, uh, one of them talks about ways to generate wealth for the family. And uh, on the list, it includes the University of Delaware and a uh, foreign relations center at the University of Pennsylvania. This is sometime in the early spring of, of 2016. Joe Biden was not going to be the president. Uh, but, but the purpose of these discussions, according to the email, uh, are two words, wealth creation. That's really actually quite common. We know that the president of, of Penn, a woman named Amy Gutman, who's now the ambassador to Germany, was in uh, Beijing meeting with high-ranking CCP officials in September of 2015. We also know that that large amounts of Chinese money began flowing into Penn um, once the Penn Biden Center was stood up. We also know that Joe Biden for, as far as anybody can tell, four visits to campus was paid approximately a million dollars by the Penn Biden Center. Now, you know, precisely where the money came from, who was making the decisions about how much 
the then vice president was going to get paid, we don't know yet. But we anticipate that information will come out. What's really kind of troubling about the Penn Biden Center uh, is that it's not unique. At Yale, uh, it was John Kerry making money, and, and, and essentially these are influence peddling operations in exchange for foreigners' donations. They get access to US decision makers. Um, how that affects teaching, it's hard to, hard to quantify. That was one of the things that if we had come back for a second term, we would have studied in a, in a rigorous manner. But certainly anecdotally, it's pretty clear that, that, that the money affects uh, what's coming out of our universities. Um, certainly we've seen that with respect to the Middle Eastern studies programs. Uh, the foreign reporting requirement was enacted by Congress to, to deal with the problem of uh, petrodollars. The Arabs in the late 70s and early 80s began pumping huge amounts of money into Harvard and Yale, partly to ensure that uh, the children of the rulers could come to the United States and have a good time, but partly because they saw that as a way of changing American political attitudes and behavior towards Israel and the Middle East. Um, again, anecdotally, it seems that, that they have been quite successful uh, and that there is a, a strong correlation between what is taught in foreign funded centers and um, who's paying the bills. Um, it isn't just, I should point out, it isn't just Middle Eastern centers, but the CCP, when they finance teaching or research, uh, there tends to be a, um, shall we say, sensitivity on the part of college administrators towards criticizing uh, either the CCP, the Chinese government, or, or really anything that, that they care much about. That's why there's been such silence about the Uyghurs. Um, Again, can I? There isn't a study that we can point to that empirically connects the two, but the evidence is sure pretty compelling. Um, finally, what's the role of Middle Eastern actors? Well, the Saudis still pay a lot of money, um, not as perhaps as much as they did at one point because the pool has grown larger. So, um, generally speaking, they're not, they don't have the weight they had once, but the Qataris for sure, um, in a big way. Some documents just came out, I think, last night or this morning um, from Texas A&M uh, documenting approximately $460 million in contracts and gifts from the Qatar Foundation to Texas A&M University. Given Texas A&M's products, most notably petroleum engineering and nuclear engineering, and given the fact that Texas A&M has uh, a branch in Qatar where they admit students from all over the Middle East, including Iran, uh, the national security implications of this uh, relationship ought to be self-evident. Um, so that's basically where we're at. Uh, the Biden administration has not shut down the program that we stood up, at least not overtly, uh, but it's not pursuing the universities, we opened approximately 20 investigations of American high institutions of higher education in 18 months, um, asking them to document money coming in and money reported to the government. That has stopped uh, primarily because the higher education lobby and, and industry is a major Biden administration stakeholder. Um, honestly, we didn't care so much what they had to say. Uh, we treated them like any other industry and we regulated them accordingly. Um, but the laws are still on the books and uh, there are ways for, for folks to uh, kind of find out what your local university is up to with respect to its foreign relationships. And I'm happy to take any questions people might have. Thank you so much for that. And I apologize again for the uh, technical issues and pronouncing your name wrong. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. I appreciate you correcting us. Uh, so J.R. Pride asks, in terms of what is taught, how much influence do you think is brought to bear? Oh, I, I think it's it's quite substantial. We know this from um, most recently the the CCP and, and they're, they're these they run these centers called Confucius centers, 
Um, you may have heard about them uh, in 20, I want to say 2018, 2019, there was a very extensive Senate investigation of Confucius centers. And, and what they found is that these are propaganda outlets. They're vehicles for projecting soft power. Um, the CCP is not, you know, didn't create this sort of thing out of whole cloth. But, you know, in fairness, the Arabs have been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, the Alawid Center at Georgetown um, is, is a particularly interesting test case. It was set up after 9-11, um, a very substantial gift by Saudi prince to, to the folks at Georgetown to create a center that has absolutely nothing to do with academics. It's about providing access to Western journalists and Western diplomats and allowing the Saudis to get the message out. It is a, it is a propaganda operation. So, um, you know, Georgetown, to my knowledge, has never had a bad thing to say about, about anyone in the Gulf. Um, and it's very hard to find a university administrator who has anything uh, negative to say about the CCP, whether it's Stanford or, or Yale. Um, one of the things that, that frankly troubled me very substantially was um, at approximately the same time the president of Yale was issuing a statement, this is the spring of 2020, um, claiming that that uh, what happened to George Floyd was an indictment of each and every American. He was yucking it up with Xi Jinping in, in uh, China, knowing that Chinese are running full-on concentration camps and engaging in all sorts of horrific uh, human rights abuses. And about those things, he had nothing to say. So, Coming back to my earlier comment, you know, it's a mistake to conceptualize universities as American institutions in any meaningful sense of the term. Um, they're going to follow the money, and the teaching follows the money. And so, where you see substantial amounts of foreign investment in a center or in a, uh, a discipline, uh, it's certainly reason to be cautious and, and have red flags go up. Absolutely. Thank you. Sharon A.S. In your Department of Education webinar during COVID, Iran was mentioned as a problem and men were indicted. Uh, did anything come from that after all these years? Uh, yeah, there was a fellow at Harvard, Charles Lieber, um, who didn't see much jail time at all. There were, there were others um, across the country. Um, unfortunately, There were other ongoing projects that, that were shut down with the change of administration. Um, one of the reasons that we had runway to do the investigations that we did, all of which, by the way, um, the investigative letters are still posted on the Department of Education website. If you type in section 117 of the HEA, one of the search results will take you to this landing page we created and which is still there. So you can see all the work that we did. Um, remember that we had a, an all of government uh, approach to dealing with the security threat posed by the CCP. And um, Department of Education worked with other government partners you know, to, to address that threat. Um, but these investigations are complex. You have to unravel, um, you have to get the financial records, then you have to have the people who have the capacity to understand them. And uh, listen, Harvard and Yale and Penn, and Texas and Michigan, they hire, they can hire really bright people and they know how to set up they know how to set up intermediary organizations and how to move money around. Cornell, for example, has a foundation in the United States. It also has a foundation based in London, and which is where the Arabs, the Gulf Arabs bank. So, you know, un, un, kind of un twisting all that is, is it takes time. 
And uh, the current administration, for whatever reason, decided that, that a number of ongoing projects would be stopped. And so they were. Thank you so much. So the question from Winfield Myers, who is going to be the, the host today, asks, uh, what are the greatest weaknesses of our current system for reporting foreign gifts, as well as are there any provisions in play that would require universities to specify the recipient of foreign gifts and contracts? Um, so the, the short answer to the second one is that the, that there is. We We did some work at the end of the admin to try and uh, require disclosure of, of the actual donor or contracting party. Um, and the info, that information is supposed to be provided to the department. If there's no follow-up, well, you know, there, there's not going to be good compliance. We know that. In terms of, of kind of things that need to be fixed with, with the current law, um, the the current law is very workable if you have if you have um, a federal government that's committed to enforcing it. Um, there is plenty of leeway and ample ample authority under the statute that Congress wrote to allow for aggressive oversight. The problem is. Um, that you have to be able to analyze and process and mine the information. The Department of Education is not set up to do any of those things. It was never intended to do any of those things. It is functionally a check writing agency. Uh, it is almost 100% captured by the institutions it's supposed to regulate. So it's kind of a, it was, it was, it was immediately obvious that, that the knowledge and skills necessary to effectively conduct oversight with respect to foreign money on US campuses, it just was not there. Um, we hired some people, but you know, we, we, we were just never able to get to the point where we could efficiently staff up. However, there are other parts of the government that are very good at tracking flow of foreign money. Uh, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, the Department of Treasury, um, folks, some folks in the Department of Commerce, there are other Department of Justice, National Security Division. There are other resources, and we were working on um, we were working on trying to pull those together, the National Science Foundation and the, in the offices of the Inspector General, a variety of these agencies. They also have um, heightened resources and expertise. Uh, and all of that, you know, is taking time to put together. If you were going to um, take action to, quote, improve, close quote, the reporting statute, it would be to move uh, programmatic enforcement responsibility to uh, an agency that has knowledge and experience and, and the capacity to, to carry it out. And, and I think that in fact, I, I know, I should say, I know for a fact, Congress is looking at doing precisely that. Thank you so much. And if you wouldn't mind due to the technical issues, if we could run about 10 minutes longer. Not at all. All right, wonderful. So Deborah Glazer asks, uh, are you looking at consulting agreements with professors or opportunities for outside income in addition to their faculty wages? Uh, yeah, the way the law is written, those are supposed to be reported. Um, because if the universities are if, if, if the professor is using university affiliation as a way of, of generating private income, then there's a you know, question about where you attribute the money. Um, certainly with respect to the CCP, this is a problem uh, because what they will do is, is come to a US professor in a discipline that they have targeted, whether it's hypersonics or um, certain kinds of advanced um, chip manufacturing or you know other things 
certain kinds of materials, so forth. And they'll say, hey, you know, come to Beijing University, which by the way, is more selective than anything we have in the United States. The Chinese students who come to the US by and large are the ones who can't get into the elite Chinese institutions for getting the you know, second and third tier here. Um, and they'll say, listen, we'll give you a lab and we'll give you graduate students who are really good and work really hard. And here's $5 million or $10 million or $15 million. And the professors think this is just wonderful. Uh, the Chinese think it's just wonderful. Uh, because not, not every Chinese grad student is connected to the People's Liberation Army or the Chinese Intelligence Service, but some of them certainly are. And so um, it's a real problem. Uh, the, the folks inside, you know, who do our, our, our research enterprise uh, and, our, and our more sensitive defense and defense-related research are certainly you know, care about the problem. The issue has is, is been uh, enforcement, and, it, and it's and it's frankly getting universities to pay attention. And part of the justification I heard from the universities for not paying attention is that, well, you know, in science you share things with people all over the world. That's how scientific knowledge grows, which is true. But that doesn't mean you don't pay attention to people who are coming in and using that openness for nefarious purposes. Um, in the Middle Eastern studies vertical, it, it's, a, it's a different thing. At this point, at this point, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a, a Middle Eastern studies program that hasn't been captured by um, the people who fund it. Uh, things have changed over the last 30 years pretty pretty dramatically. And, and if you look at the kind of the scholarship that's coming out of them now, and I use that term advisedly, uh, it's hyper-political and it has a very definite anti-Israel and, and, you know, frankly, to my mind, anti-Semitic point of view in pretty much all of them. Not, not not every single one, not every single professor, obviously, but a lot of them. And, and you know, I, this organization, I think, has done great work kind of exposing, you know, the Middle Eastern Studies Associations and the other trades about what they've been up to. And um, there's been a little bit of pushback. Uh, we tried. Uh, we opened an investigation of the Duke UNC um, Middle Eastern Studies Center uh, because they take what's called Title VI federal funds for foreign language instruction. And they were using it to support, you know, some of the most um, horrific kind of anti-Semitic uh, programming you could possibly imagine. So we investigated it, first time ever that had happened. Um, but the, that, unfortunately, that kind of aspect of things is pretty far gone. And, um, you know, if 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 you were to ask me what to do about it, you know, frankly, the only thing I could say would be to cut the money off entirely, starve them, stop funding them, starve them. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so, an anonymous attendee asks: Is there a role for state governments to exercise better oversight for the universities funded by state tax money? Oh my goodness, yes. Absolutely. We're starting to see this with the uh, you know, this this diversity inclusion equity or diversity equity inclusion accessibility or whatever the formulation is today. Um yeah, sure. State universities ought to be um subject to state legislative oversight in all respects. I mean when you think about it, taxpayers subsidize these universities directly and indirectly through the federal student aid, federal student loans, um, to the tune of about $1.6 trillion. That's, that's the federal student aid portfolio. And the notion 
the notion that somehow these institutions ought to be exempt from oversight just doesn't fly. Um, it's it's frankly outrageous to ask, you know, a policeman and uh, a plumber or a store clerk to subsidize uh, these these institutions with their massive bureaucracies and uh, frankly bloated salaries. Um, to say nothing of, you know, the students who take out, you know, massive loans and then uh, expect other people to pay them back. Uh, so yeah, the answer is yes. And there are many things that states can do and should do, um, both with respect to foreign funds, but also with respect to the way universities, you know, operate and, and, and run their business. Um, like I said, they are they are multinational. Just just assume they are just normal multinational organizations. But they're businesses like any other. Uh, they may call themselves nonprofits, but that's not what they are, and they ought to be regulated like any other business might. Thank you. We have a question here from Viviana Frankel asking, do you think that this phenomenon interests also European universities? Well, it's certainly happening. Um, whether it's happening to the same degree, I don't know. The Chinese are uniquely interested in our universities. Um, because we have we we still have a robust you know scientific research program there a lot of it funded by the federal government but by others also um there are a few good universities in europe still that, that do you know very very interesting um, applied and theoretical research and of course the chinese are there um with respect to the Middle Eastern aspect of the problem, uh, the Arabs have been all over the British universities for years and years and years. The one study that, that I've seen that actually tries to uh, quantify the impact of, of Arab money on, on teaching outputs, so to speak, involved Oxford, and it was done in approximately 2010. And I found a very close correlation between uh, the money going in and the quote teaching close quote going out. So in our last moment here, uh, Ali Post asks, or Ali Post asks, what can and should we do to stop the foreign influence? Hmm. Well, um, you got to get the federal government to do its job. Let's start with that. Uh, number one. Number two, you got to get the state governments to start going after state universities. Uh, and number three, we have to disenthrall ourselves of the idea that, that somehow what we, what, what the, the Harvard or Yale or Dartmouth or Penn or, or, you know, those places that we enjoyed as young people and that send us those nice uh, you know, alumni magazine, we have these fond memories of, of having fun, have to disenthrall ourselves of the notion that they're anything other than profit making institutions. And that many of them, frankly, don't, you know, to the extent they care about America and the American ideal are, are overtly hostile. And, and it's not to say that, that, and it's all of them, and it's not to say that they don't perform an important function. It's not to say there isn't good research that goes on there. There is. But we have to be very clear-eyed and we have to hold them accountable. We have to hold the regulators accountable. And um, look, the, the, the universities have become a real problem. You know, if you care about free speech, if you care about freedom of religion, you don't go to most of the you know, so-called elite universities anymore. It's it's the stories that we heard um, from students, and 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 we would do investigations, and the things that we would find were, you know, for somebody like me, when was not in that industry, 
and had, you know, I was not sent to the Department of Education because I was an education law expert. I was sent there because I had other you know, competencies, one of which was investigating financial issues. But to see what's going on and to see them on the one hand, the, the hypocrisy, and, and it has to be cynical. They have to know this. You know, they, 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 what they represent to the consumer and what they are are not the same thing. And um, ultimately, parents are consumers, students are consumers, taxpayers are consumers of the product that they sell. And you have to conceptualize it that way. And if we start treating them like businesses they are, you know, I think we'll be better off. Um, but it's 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 a real problem, and and it has uh, generational consequences as we're seeing today. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, before we go, if our viewers wanted to follow your work, where could we find that? Oh my goodness. Um, well, it, it's always going going to www.aflegal. Dot org is always a good thing to do. We are um, we're doing a lot of things and we're involved in a lot of issues. And uh, I like to think we do really, really good work. Uh, we win a lot. Um, so that's, you know, the best market signal of all. Um, but we urge you, www.aflegal.org. Well, Thanks certainly... for the opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity to do the pitch. And again, um, everybody, please keep supporting the Middle East Forum. Um, you know, on a lot of things, if they're not doing it. Nobody is. So, uh, thank you for thank you for everything you guys do. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, coming out and speaking with us today, Mr. Rubenstein. <laughs> All right. For our viewers, uh, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update with Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.